What is up guys? Today we're going to be talking about Java Reflection with help from the Java tutorial on Reflection and resources from NewThinkTank.com. And so, you know, I do get a lot of information from these slides or from the Java tutorial on Reflection as well as NewThinkTank.com. Now, what is Reflection? Um, you know, a pretty basic question as to, well, what is it? You know, Wikipedia says it's the ability of a computer program to examine and modify the structure and behavior of the program itself at runtime. And, you know, I went on to Stack Overflow just to see what the community would say about reflection. And Stack Overflow seems to agree for the most part, although it does draw the distinction between type introspection versus reflection proper. And it says that, well, there is a difference between the two. Type introspection is about just looking at the members, looking at the methods, looking at the constructors. And reflection proper seems to be more about modifying that data, modifying private data, data that you shouldn't modify. Um, invoking new things, creating new instances of a class if you're given the class, and invoking private methods. So today we're going to look at a little bit of both. Um, I'm going to look about. I'm going to take a look at how you you look at certain members of a field, as well as invoking methods. So reflection in layman's terms, you know, this is my personal take on reflection. I think that reflection is it's a very powerful and scary feature that should be used with caution. It is often used to subvert the norm of information hiding, you know, because you can access private information. You can look at private fields, private data. And it'll be, I say reflection leaves no stone unturned and transgresses all boundaries. It is a hideous beast. And then I have this quote by Friedrich Nietzsche, which says, and when you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you, because I think it's, the, the power is just so incredible. You know, just ridiculous power. But, you know, I still haven't answered the question of, well, what is reflection and what is it used for? Um, I think reflection, based upon my experience, based upon this research that I've done, is the ability, because of its ability to modify private members of a class at runtime, as well as just generally looking at the class itself, it is used quite often in debugging. Um, you know, you can set up dummy variables because you can set private data. So you can set up pri dummy, dummy things. And Derek Bannis over at NewThinkTank.com says that he thinks the, the term class manipulator fits much better with, than the term reflection because reflection is, is, is a little vague, you know. It's a little vague, a little ambiguous, and he thinks that class manipulator is the way to go. So one of the things that really clicked for me when it came to reflection was realizing that reflection is about looking at the class itself, okay. You should toss out everything regarding instances of a class or objects because you're looking at the class itself. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't make a new instance of a class based on taking this class at runtime and invoking this constructor. Um, so I'm not saying you can't do that, but the most important thing is about looking at the class itself. Okay? You are not limited to an instance of a class. Um, some of Java reflection, the Java Reflection API's core tenants are inspecting the class and method modifiers. So you want to look at a class. Um, you want to look at the method and you want to see, well, is it private? Is it public? Is it final? Is it abstract? Okay. You can inspect constructors, methods, and their parameters. You can invoke these as well. You can look. You can get and set private data. You can do all of these things. And so I had this note here at the bottom, which says use with caution, you know, because you can do so many of these things. And it's just really crazy um, that you can do all these things. Um, and so, yeah, use with caution. Now, the basis of all reflection is grabbing the class itself. And so over here, I have this line of code, which is foo.getClass. So foo is a string. It's a string literal. And then I say dot get class. So what that does is, that's going to go into, the, into foo and get the class. Okay, and then when I say the get, see I get name, to see what is the name of the class, it's java.lang.string. That was some pretty basic stuff. We're going to be using a lot of this stuff as we move on in reflection. But let's make it more interesting. Let's look at some of the methods in, in the string class. So what, what I've done here is, well, I call the class, and I say method, array, an array of methods, okay? So, you know, this is one of the things that I, that I thought was pretty cool, is that you actually have a, have a there's a class called method, and here we are making an array of methods. Now, what does get declared methods do? What's the, this is the crux of this example. So get declared methods actually goes and it'll list and it returns all the methods that are in the class string. This includes public and private methods, which is one of the scary things. So you could actually call c.get methods without the declared, but what would that return? Well, only the private, only the public methods. You wouldn't get the private methods. And so you really lose a lot of the, you know, maybe you want to play it safe. And so you call just regular get methods as opposed to get declared methods. And so here I just have a basic enhanced for loop for every method in this array, print it out and see what we're looking at. And so I've done just that and we see that there's um, all these, all these uh, methods in string, value of, concat, contains, char at, check bounds, code point at, 
and all these different methods. And so that's pretty much what we've done here. Now, if that wasn't interesting enough, we can also go through and look at the method parameters themselves. So I've added some code here at the bottom, which is an array of type class, and I'll call it parameter type, is equal to m.get parameter types. And so it's pretty basic. I'm just going through, taking a look at the parameters in each method. So for every method inside of the array of methods, I've gone, made an array of classes, of type class, and I'm just going to print out every type, every parameter type in the method. So, you know, we have this looking at method offset by code points. Parameter 1 is type of int. Parameter 2 is of type int as well. And so, you know, we have this over here, java.lang.string, which has four parameters. Three of them are ints. One is a string. So, you know, pretty interesting, interesting stuff. We can use this to manipulate the class and to invoke a method. Now, this is moving on to some of the more interesting stuff, which is I made a dummy class here um, with two private instance variables and two methods. And so note their, note their modifiers, though, because I have this int called private int foobar, private string zap. So this is private data. Okay? And the whole point of making it private is so that you cannot see these members of the class. And then I have a public int foo and then a private string bar, just to see, you know, just some, just some easy methods to look at. So the, the question, though, is, well, how would I go about looking at the members in test class? And so here I've done pretty much the same thing with um, fields as I have with the methods in string. So I, except this time, instead of an array of methods, I'm making an array of fields. So field array fields is equal to c1.get declared fields. Once again, note the declared. The declared means that I want all the fields, public and private, and put them into the array called fields. So I'm pretty much just doing the same thing for every field inside that array fields. I'm going through, printing it out, as well as getting the modifier type to see what is the type of this private field, or this field. Is it private? Is it public? Is it static? So on and so forth. Is it final? Which gives me foobar is a private field. Zap is a private field. So there's actually a bug in my slides. Oh, no, there's not. Well, not on this side anyway. So I, I have a private in foobar. Okay, so it goes through, gets the field foobar, and it says, well, it's private. It prints it out. And the same thing for zap. So let's add this code, though, um, and let's see exactly what this data is holding. What is this data referring to? And over here, the, the, the crux of this thing, of, of, of this, of getting what's in the field itself is one, to get the name of the field itself, to get the name. Okay, so if you look back on the slide, you see that I have a, I have a, the name is called zap. Okay, so that's the name of the variable itself. It's called zap. And so you have to know the name beforehand or you get it with reflection. Okay, so I get I got the field with zap. The second thing, the most important thing here, really important as well, is to set it accessible. You know, so not only do you have to get it, you have to say, well it's accessible, I can get it and I can look at it. And so here I say string what's in zap is equal to string zap dot get example, you know, so example is my instance of my test class, just a simple name. And then I say, well, print line, what is zap holding? And it prints it out. Information Zap is holding, he who shall not be named. And if you look back on a few slides, you'll see that that's exactly what Zap says, he who shall not be named. Okay, so pretty scary, pretty powerful. One of the reasons why I think reflection is so powerful, you can do what should not be done. Now over here, you know, there's also a question of, well, how can we invoke private methods, which I think is also really, really interesting. So what we have here, there, there are, I would say, you know, three steps, three keys to invoking a private method. The first one is, well, getting the method parameters. So you make an array of classes um, that are the method parameters. Basically, what is the type of each parameter? So if I have a method that takes a string and an int and another int, I would have the same thing here, but it would be java.lang.string, integer.type, integer.type. So what this method parameter only takes a one int. And so I've done just that an object, so the actual parameters themselves, what you actually want to pass into the method, okay? And so a new integer 1000, and so here I make the method itself, get the method, pass in the type, set it accessible, and now here I'm going to say private method dot invoke. So you, you take the method itself, and then you have to say invoke on the instance of that class, and then pass in the actual parameters, and we're going to see here what we print out. What is this number 1000 and how did you get here, which is what the method returns. So in conclusion, um, there's more to reflection than what I just covered. I think I just covered the, the tip of the iceberg. There's really a lot more you can do with reflection, such as looking at 
constructors, parsing and identifying constructors, calling them. Um, you know, we took a look at how to get the data in the field, to get, to get the information that a field is holding, but there's a lot more we can do, such as actually setting that data. Um, I mean, all, the main point I want to leave you guys with, though, is reflection is a very powerful and capable tool. Um, a lot of things that you can do with reflection, um, and I think I've only covered the tip of the iceberg, but I'm sure there's a lot of things you can do with reflection. And that is my presentation on reflection.